let's take our Bibles and open them to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to, the, uh, to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word. I ask, Lord, that tonight as we look in your word, you'll help us to look for you and know that uh, we will find you there. And Lord, help us to come to know you better. Bless the teaching of your word now, and yet, uh, bring forth the fruit that you desire from it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we began looking last week about this uh, doctrine of Balaam, and that is, uh, <coughs> Balaam was a, a preacher, he was a prophet, he was hired by the enemy to come and curse the Israelites as they were coming by, and he refused to do so. If you want to know more about that, uh, those events, they're found in the book of Numbers, uh, beginning right around chapter 22 or so, and we're not going to go into that deeply, other than what he's specifically mentioning here is um, things that were represented as, here's how to destroy God's people. And so one of the things was mentioned, uh, eating things sacrificed to idols and committing fornication, and the intermarriage of the Israelites with, uh, in other words, God's people with uh, Satan's people, people that had not accepted God, they had rejected him, and they were people of the world. <clears throat> and then he goes on and talks about those that uh, hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and we've studied that into that also. I want to look a little bit about history, um, some things going on, and uh, uh, early in the 4th century, so this would have been the uh, early 300 A.D., uh, era, not, not 300 itself, but in the early 300s. And so remember the, um, whatever century you're in is the next one. Like right now we're considered to be in the 21st century, even though we're only in the 2000s. It took me a long time to understand and, and it still uh, only makes a little bit of sense. But anyways, that's the way they work it. So in, in the 300s or so, um, <clears throat> The, the Roman Empire was ruled by a man of, uh, by the name of Diocletian, and he died. Upon his death, two other men vied for the position of the emperor of Rome. And you had in the west side of the Roman Empire a man by the name of Constantine, and then on the east side was a man named Men uh, Menentius. And if you wonder which one, well... Find the one that has a big, well-known uh, city named after him, and that's the one who won. So the man, uh, there's a city named Constantinople, and that's named after Constantine. Uh, but both of them were determined to succeed Diocletian. <coughs> and there was going to be a great battle between them. And um, Legend or tradition tells that Constantine had a vision the night before that battle, and according to, to the account, it's that he saw a, a cross or some type of symbol similar to a cross in the sky. And there was a sign that said, by this sign, conquer. And so he, he claims that uh, he converted to, to Christianity that day. 
And of course, the next day he went on and won the battle, um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, really what took place is he bargained with Satan to join or, or to declare Christ. You know, and I'm going to put the word Christianity in air quotes there uh, to be the official religion of the Roman Empire if he won the battle. And of course, from history, we know that he did win the battle. He declared himself a Christian. Uh, Christian leaders were invited to witness the wholesale baptism of entire regiments of, uh, of his army. Uh, hundreds and thousands of men just being baptized uh, with no conversion in, internally. What, what had happened is there, there was a lot of false religion that had crept into Christianity by this point. And one of the teachings that had crept in was, was the teaching of... Uh, uh, and in fact, it was before Constantine, long before Constantine, it's addressed by, uh, by the Apostle Peter. <clears throat> but uh, the, 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 the false doctrine of the need to be baptized to go to heaven. And there's a group that still teaches that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and they, they, well, there's, there's a few different religions uh, that teach that. And uh, Roman Catholicism is one of them. Uh, another big one that teaches it is the, the Church of Christ, and they teach that without baptism you can't go to heaven. And the big problem with that is it's not what Jesus taught. And so if we're gonna if we're gonna concern ourselves with the truth that Jesus taught, then we have to we have to look into the Bible. And Jesus looked at the thief on the cross next to him and he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well that man never had been baptized. In fact, he had never been saved until that very, that very day, within the last uh, few minutes or hour or so. And so he had just come to know Jesus as Savior and never had a chance to be baptized. He died without ever being baptized. And, and yet Jesus said to him specifically that that very day he'd be with him in heaven. And, and people will say, well, that, uh, that was still the Old Testament era. That's a common argument. That was Old Testament time, and, and baptism wasn't necessary in the Old Testament time. It's just in the New Testament time. Well, the New Testament, we would say, began upon the death of Jesus. That's when a testament takes effect. Your last will and testament takes effect when you die. And we know that Jesus died before the thief on the cross. When they came because the day was... was um, uh, waning and they needed to get the, the, the bodies off of the crosses because there was a, an extra Sabbath that week and they're not allowed to touch a, a dead body once that Sabbath begins. Keep in mind the day for the Jew in that day and time began at 6 o'clock in the evening and so they had to have these people down off the cross and interred before 6 o'clock. And so they, they needed to hurry up the process. They couldn't just let them die naturally on the cross. Uh, the way they normally would. So they broke the legs of the two malefactors, the, the man on the right and the man on the left of Jesus. They broke their legs. Now, there was a prophecy that the, the Savior would not have any bones broken. And so when they came to Jesus, they stuck a spear in his side. We know that water and blood came out. And they knew by that, he's already dead. We don't need to break his leg. So he died, which would have put us into the New Testament era. And... So this man that had called out unto him for salvation on the cross is still alive, and now he's in the New Testament era, and still went to heaven, and he's still there some 2,000 plus years later. And so, uh, but that false doctrine of, of needing to be baptized had begun very early on in Christianity. And so now they're saying the, the way to be saved and, and, and the way to convert to, and I'm going to put that in, Christi, uh, to convert to Christianity, is baptism. Baptism doesn't convert you. It shows that a conversion has already taken place. And, and so, uh, but here's uh, tens of thousands of people that were not converted at all, not saved at all. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, with all the profession and pomp, there was no evidence of any of them ever being born again. After his declaration, the declaration of uh, Constantine, it now became popular to become a Christian. He made, he, he named, he basically, here's what happened. He 
took a, a, a bucket of whitewashed paint, and I'm speaking figuratively now, and he just put a coat of paint on the polytheism that existed in the Roman Empire. They didn't, they didn't worship just one god, they worshiped a multitude of them, and they had Jupiter and Mars and this person and that person. Most of them were, were just whitewashed versions of Greek gods, uh, Zeus and, and so on and so forth. And they had just kind of slid them over into when, when the Roman Empire absorbed the, uh, the Greeks and they absorbed their, their intellectual, uh, they absorbed the language and made that the official language throughout the empire. But they just kind of renamed the gods and gave them Roman names. And then when Constantine came along, he said, well, we're going to call our religion Christianity. And so he took names from the Bible and applied them to the gods that they were already worshiping. So very little change in, in the way of the religion of the Roman Empire other than the names, the actual practices and everything else. They added baptism to the whole thing. Uh, but, but as far as the religion itself, they just put Christian names on these people. Uh, uh, these false gods that they had, and then called it Christianity. And so, uh, <clears throat> Constantine is said to have waited to be baptized uh, until his deathbed. And because, uh, again, the, the teaching was that baptism is what saved you, and he wanted to make sure that that was the last thing he did on this planet before dying, so that there wasn't any risk of of getting his salvation undone by some sin that he would commit afterwards. And so um, this, this church was taken over by Satan's emissaries. Let's turn to uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And the Bible warns us of, of events and things like this. In verse 13... The Bible says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers. Look at this. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And so in other words, these, these teachers, these preachers are claiming to be apostles of Christ. But the reality of them, it says they are false apostles. They are deceitful workers. And then verse 14 says, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Uh, the name Lucifer means light bearer. And, and so the, the Bible tells us that, you know, Hollywood likes to depict Satan as this, this guy in a red suit with horns and a tail with a point on the end of it and a pitchfork in his hand. And nothing could be further from the truth. If, <clears throat> if the world saw Satan for what he was and, and, and he was positively identified, they would never recognize him. The Bible tells us that he transforms himself he, he presents himself as an angel of light. Uh, there's a major religion all around the world right now that says we were founded on a foundation, uh, on a revelation that was given to us by the angel of light. And I believe that statement uh, is a, a statement of absolute truth tucked into uh, many other things that they, ha that they believe but that, are, that are lies. And... Um, so you can look that up. You can Google which religion was, was, uh, uh, had an angel of light. Uh, I don't know what, what uh, the Internet would tell you, uh, but if you dig deep enough, you'll find out that Joseph Smith made that claim that an angel of light appeared unto him, told him where certain manuscripts, uh, plates were buried, and then uh, uh, some, I call them magic rocks, that he, he made frames for, and they were translucent. He could see through them. And he made frames for him, turned them into glasses, and then he could, they were magic decoder rocks. The first decoder ring, uh, the first decoder glasses that ever were, Joseph Smith had them, and he looked at these plates, and then he translated them into the, what's become known the Book of Mormon. Uh, and it was an angel of light. Yes, no doubt it was, because there's many conflicts between the Bible and the Book of Mormon. One of the things they teach is, that Jesus and Satan are brothers, and that is certainly not the Bible. Uh, the Bible says Jesus is the Son of God, Satan is a created being, and <clears throat> who uh, rejected his position and tried to take over heaven and exalted himself before God and was cast out. Now, uh, this idea, this, this combining false religion and Christianity 
is uh, what had what took place in Pergamos, and it was taking place in in the in in God's church in Pergamos. And so he comes to John and he says, "I want you to write a letter to the pastor at that church." And he he says, "I know there's some good things you've been doing." He said, "But there's a few things I have against you." And you've been you've been allowing you've been marrying false doctrine and lies and things of the world, the doctrine of Balaam, and um, it's causing uh, it, it's because it's a stumbling block uh, to to my people there, uh, <clears throat> the ecumenical church, the ecumenical movement, and that that simply means just a, a, a just a joining together, and there's just there's a a, a movement a. A philosophy that's been around for as long as I can remember. I remember hearing that term just as a very little boy, and I was wondering, what does that mean? What does that mean? And it just means a, uh, uh, bringing together of all the religions. And and on the surface, that seems like a noble goal, uh, something to be desired. And there's there's a lot of different organizations that have been founded and started to to bring that. That uh, about uh, one of them is the World Council of Churches. Then we have the National Council of Churches, and then sometimes in states there's a statewide council, or sometimes a, a countywide council of churches. And and it's just this desire to get all the churches uh, to be unified again. And I'm not against unification. I think God wants us to to get together, but not at the expense of truth. Not in a, not in a, uh, to compromise what's right. Uh, he's always said there's a line that divides right from wrong. And God says, I've always wanted you on my side of the line. But God cannot and will not live on the wrong side of that line. He will not compromise himself, uh, his integrity and who he is uh, for the sake of unity. He makes a way for people to leave error and come to light. And that way is available to all mankind. The light came into the world and it shone in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not, but it was still there. And they, whether they understood it or not, doesn't change the fact that God provided the way for people to leave error and come to what was right, come to the light. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the first seeds of what has become the Roman Empire, the Roman, I'm sorry, the Roman Catholic Church were sown in the early 300s, the first pope was Constantine. And, and he was the political leader of the world at that time. He was the emperor of the Roman Empire. And so they were the superpower. They didn't control the whole world at the time, but, but a big part of it. And so he was a political leader of that entire empire. And then by declaring an official religion, he put himself at the head of that religion and governed religiously as well. There's two things that are necessary to rule the world. You have to be able to rule politically, but if you don't, if you don't rule in the religious realm of the world, you'll never rule the whole world for very long. Uh, and so in order to, to rule the religious realm of the world, all the religions are going to have to be unified. And that's what the World Council of Churches is trying to do. That's what the National Council of Churches is trying to do. That's what the new versions of the Bible are trying to do. They're getting more and more watered down to where any religion can pick up a modern Bible and say, that book is talking about us. And, and I don't mean any religion with a root in Christianity. I mean any religion at all. And so the words are being, are being changed, and the new words that are being used are words that mean different things in other religions. For example, uh, the, the Bible, the Word of God, talks about the Holy One of Israel. Now, we know who that is. The new versions drop the word holy, and they'll say, the one, and with the capital O on there. Now, those of us that are Christians, we look at that and say, okay, we know that's talking about God. But people of other religions and some of the New Age religions, they, they, that's not the, the God that we think about. 
they, they have a, a term, the one, and it means something different than what the Holy One means. But see, that new Bible version incorporates their teaching and their theology into it, and it's completely unknown to, to those that are Christians, because to us, it means something different. And, and that little bit of change isn't enough for us to say, well, that's a big change. We say, well, that's just something minor, um, and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> no big deal. But it is a big deal, because it's not something minor. Words have meaning. So, uh, the Roman church claims to be of divine origin, but actually its deeds and doctrines are hated by Christ. They teach there is a different way to heaven outside of Jesus. They teach there's seven things you have to do that you have to perform to get into heaven. And, and of course, one of them is baptism. One of them is uh, um, uh, oh, I lost the uh, uh, rites of chastity. And then the others are rites of marriage. And so many of them are, are self-contradictory. You can't possibly keep all seven of these, and, and it's by design. So since you can't possibly keep all seven of these, then through the, their own teaching, you can't get yourself into heaven. You have to go to a waiting place until enough of your family spends enough money in the church for them to have enough masses for you to get you out of purgatory and, and over that last hump and on into heaven. It, it's, it's just one false Doctrine, one lie after another, after another, after another, after another. And, and today, the, the world is so ready to accept the Roman Pope and be subject unto him. And he's, he's moving their church even more and more deeper into the world uh, than it ever was before. Uh, I should say more openly so. They're not separated. They're not dedicated to Jesus and his true doctrine. Um, the church members are not a peculiar people. You'd be hard-pressed to know them from anybody who did not claim Christianity in the way that they live. Uh, they're not transformed daily by the renewing of the mind. They don't refrain from the appearance of evil. They're not casting off an unequal yoke, and they're not coming out from uh, they're not coming out from among uh, the the worldliness and being separate. Um, Nothing besets a church like the word tolerance. Oh, we've got to be more tolerant. We've got to be so tolerant. Um, if you'll read through the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll find the church of Corinth was known for its tolerance. And it was one of the most worldly churches uh, that we find in the New Testament. And there was so much that had to be corrected there. Here, Jesus is addressing the church in Pergamos, and he mentions... He mentions a couple things that they need to address, and, and uh, just within a verse or two, and then he moves on to somebody else. Uh, we have an entire book called 1 Corinthians where God is saying, all right, uh, Christians at Corinth, my church at Corinth, there's a whole lot you need to address. And a lot of it had to do with their, what we would, and that word tolerance is such a misused word, but them tolerating or putting up with and not just putting up with, but even accepting and adopting the, the practices from the world into their own church. And then going beyond what even the world was doing. It's the sin of laxity. And it's allowing a condition to exist that God looks at and says, that needs corrected. That needs corrected. See, our attitude towards evil is to be one of, of hatred. Now, not, not that we should hate people, but I'm talking about evil deeds. I'm talking about we should hate sin. We should hate wrongdoing. I like what John R. Rice's wife said. Uh, she said, teach your children to hate sin because if you don't, they're going to want to try it as they get older. And, and they'll have an appetite for it and they're going to want to get a taste of it. And, and we're, it's not that we're supposed to put up with it and, and get along with it. We're supposed to abort it. We need to remember that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And that's what had been forgotten in the church at Pergamos. These false teachings, these false doctrines had crept in, and the pastor had failed to stand up and say, that's wrong, and we're not going to have that teaching here. And it had not been addressed. And so um, Pergamos churches are not going to experience a revival until they repent of their laxity 
in their tolerance. In fact, in verse 16, back in Revelation 2, the verse starts with that word, repent, or else. And what a sharp command is found there. It's not a command to the unsaved. It's a command to the Christians, to the members of that church, and a command to its pastor. And if we allow sin and wickedness to remain in the church house, in the church family, then, then there's no hope for any revival. Uh, we're either for Christ or against Him. The Bible says we cannot serve God and man. We cannot have and we cannot serve two masters. It's always been fatal for a church to be identified with the world or allowed to be governed by the state. Uh, the, the separation of church and state is, is not a new concept. You can go back and, and uh, look into King Saul and what he did and find God's viewpoint of the marriage of, of religion and po the political realm. Um, it is not for us to do. And what I mean by that is the political realm should never govern the spiritual the, the, the government, whether it be state government, federal government, uh, the United Nations world government, and so that's the movement to get one world political realm, and the World Council of Churches is one of the tools to get a one world religious realm. Uh, uh, but the church should not be subject to those. We, we look at the Bible and we say we have a, a higher authority. The authority under which we exist is commanded by somebody higher up than the President of the United States or the leader of the United Nations or the leader of, um, of NATO even. Uh, <clears throat> it's, the, the question comes down to, is Christ the Lord of your life? And Jesus said that, that if, if they won't repent, repent or else. He says, I will come unto thee quickly. And will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Of course, we know the sword is the word of God. Uh, the Bible tells us that Balaam was slain with the sword. Jesus said that, that he himself didn't come to judge. There was someone else that would judge. And he makes reference to his word. And it's what, it's what makes the division, uh, the line between right and wrong, the line between those who are with him and those who are against him. There's not a whole lot of, there's not a, there's not, let's go back to John chapter 3 uh, and see if there's any in-between area. John chapter 3. And of course, a very famous verse, <clears throat> verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, meaning the Son the only begotten Son. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. So he says, here's a way to not be in that category, that group of the condemned. Your faith, your trust has to be completely in Jesus Christ. He says, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He said, it's as simple as this. It's, it's yes or no. There's not an in-between. It's right or wrong. There's not, there's not a, a, a gray area. It's very black or white. He says you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. This, verse 19, and this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. So he says it's not that the world didn't have a light. It's not that they were never exposed to what was right. It's not that they didn't know. It's not that they, they never had a chance or never had an opportunity. He said because light did come into the world. And what happened? Men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Those that are living in wrong, living in sin, they don't want to be 
they don't want there to be a contrast against them. And it is to the church, it is to the, uh, the people of God, it is to the Christians to provide that contrast. People might say, you know, I've asked some people, I said, who is, who's the light? And then, oh, Jesus is the light. Jesus is light. And while he was here, Jesus was the light. But Jesus looked at his disciples and he told them, and we today that are saved, we're to be in that group. We're his disciples. And he said, ye are the light of the world. And he said, a, a city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. So he said, don't, don't hide yourself. You need to be up where you can be seen. If somebody's a Christian, people around them ought to know it. There ought to be something in their life where they're living in a different way. Not, not in, see what had happened in Pergamos is they were Christians, but they had allowed the world to govern the way they lived. Instead of letting God govern, they had allowed people to come in and teach them that things were okay, that, hey, fornication is all right, and, and uh, uh, you know, having a relationship with idols, false gods, and bowing down to them, and, and courting them. There's nothing really wrong with that. There's nothing to it. And, and, and so there was false doctrines that had come in. And they were, they were bowing down to those things or, or yielding themselves to those things. And God said, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. Uh, <clears throat> verse 21 here in John 3 says, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Uh, <clears throat> So he's very clear here that without salvation, without Jesus, a person is, is in the category, in the column of being condemned. And for them, eternal hellfire awaits. Those that are saved have eternal salvation, have eternal life awaiting them. And he says, you're to be a light in this dark world. And the, the, the church, Christianity, for a very, by and large part, that which calls itself Christianity is failing in this area, failing to be different. There, there are, are preachers, there's even missionaries, and if you were to go into their homes, you'd find alcohol in their cabinets. Not, not just something to cook with and not just something... Uh, to put on a, a scrape, not rubbing out. I'm talking about liquor. Now, that's not what the Bible teaches. You find all throughout churches that call themselves Christian, all throughout America, all around the world, rock bands. Churches with music that, that had its roots and, and beginning in, in false religion, in, in paganism. And now they just put a, a coat of paint on it and call it Christian. Well, we put different names. We put different words in it. But the, re, the, the, the music and the beat and the, the, the rhythm, the way it's manipulated, it's been adopted from the world. And God has a desire. And he says, repent or else I will come to thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He said that, that false doctrine, here's how it's dealt with. We open up the Bible and we proclaim the truth. And so the fight that is, that is fought is not a physical fight. It is a, a, a fight of truth against lie, uh, good against evil in that realm. He said, I will come unto thee. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them. God wants, to be, wants there to be a clear difference between his people and Listen, if, think about this for a little bit. If you're unsaved, if you're unsaved and you know it, deep down what you're looking for is hope. That's what you're looking for. You're, you're hoping that there's another way. You're hoping that there's, there's something else, there's something more, there's something that will deliver you from the despair that you live in. 
And along comes this, this group called Christianity. And they claim to have that hope. And so you begin to look at the members of Christianity and you see they are in the same boat I'm in. Then why would you go to them? But if you look at them and you see, you know what? There is something different about them. That there's something real to that claim that they're making. I can see that it has made a true difference in their life. Not just when they're in church on Sunday, and not just when they're in church on Sunday evening, and not, you know, they go Wednesday, but, but also on Monday, also on Tuesday. I notice it's made a difference in their vocabulary. I notice it's made a difference in their, their disposition, in their outlook on life. I notice that they don't live in a despair and hopelessness. And yes, they have difficulties and they have hard days and everything else, but they face those days and come through them with a different spirit about them. And, and they are really, they don't look at the way they're living as, as a, uh, being downtrodden and something that's been forced upon them. It's, it's, they're finding freedom in God's way of living. And God desires for us to be a true light in this world. And we can't be a light if we have covered ourselves with the filth and dirt and soot of this world. And so he says to Pergamos, you need to turn away from that. And you need to do it quickly. Or I'm going to come and, and I'll straighten some things out. Uh, let's stand tonight. We'll close with a word of prayer. Next week, we will get into the church <clears throat> um, in Thyatira and begin studying uh, the letter that was written to them. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and for preserving it for us, for uh, making it uh, apropos to where we live today. God, what a miraculous book it truly is. That even after all these years of being given, it's still has an effect and is still appropriate. As we leave here tonight, we pray that you take us uh, safely, return us again in safety, and bless the services on Sunday, but we ask it in Jesus' name.